Wealth Research Group interviews are now officially expanding their reach and opening up to new guests from various walks of life. The need in today's world to develop a sense of open-mindedness, to understand how others view the world, how division and intolerance is economically destructive, is critical to Wealth Research Group. Therefore, the interviews will surprise with new guests, fresh topics, and lots of inspiration through learning about the journey of other people and their research and experience. Today, Wealth Research Group welcomes TEDx speaker Richard Wilkinson, an income inequality expert. In the U.S., this could well be the greatest domestic threat to its well-being, so enjoy. Welcome to the Tons of Industry Show. We're transition, transitioning into a top quality series of interviews with professors and people that are TEDx speakers on topics that are truly fascinating. With today's guest, what I've loved about him is that in a 17-minute uh, TED, uh, TEDx speech that he's done, you can learn more than in months of doing your own research, and that's so effective. I loved his uh, speech, and therefore, I wanted to get him on. In 2009, he founded... Uh, the the Equality Trust. Richard Wilkinson is our guest. He was awarded a 2013 Silver Rose Award from Solidar for championing uh, equality. And, and in 2014, he won the uh, Charles Cooley Memorial Medal by the Irish Cancer Society. And you can Google all about him um, and, and see how impressive his uh, resume is and everything like that. But more importantly, he's here with us for about 20 to 30 minutes. So I really want to ask him some serious questions about today's world. The idea of the interview is to listen and to see how other people are viewing the world. Richard, thank you for jumping on this call. Oh, thank you for having me. I really want to ask you first, should societies have policies to shrink wealth gaps and income inequality, or should governments look for ways to uh, find out why it's happening in the first place? In other words, should we attack the result by taxing the rich or, or put other regulations in place? Or should we look for how it is, um, um, it is possible for people to earn eight figures a year while other people are, you know, can't afford a toaster, both living in the same city, in the same country, um, supposedly with, with all the same opportunity uh, in front of us. So, uh, please. Well, as you might expect, I'd, I'd say both. Uh, we have to do some redistribution. Uh, we do, most societies, most rich societies do much less redistribution than they did. Uh, but even more important than that is to reduce the differences in market incomes that have taken off over the last, uh, well, 30 years, I suppose. Um, and in, in, if you look at big American companies in the 90, early 1980s, you find the CEOs were, were earning perhaps 30 or 40 times as much as the average production worker. But by the first decade this century, they were, were earning three or four hundred times as much. So suddenly that gap within societies widened, within companies widened dramatically. Uh, and although you and I have both uh, talked about earnings, I don't think those uh, figures are earned in any meaningful sense. Very interesting. Um, you know, my, my other question to you with regards to all of this, and, and I know you've done extensive research on this subject and that uh, this is something you've been fascinated about for many, many years. Um, it is, I want to ask you, you know, is inequality a problem even? When does it become a problem? Meaning, uh, what is the definition of unproductive inequality? When does it become a negative thing for society? Because, you know, honestly, uh, growing up, my father went through three bankruptcies. And when I saw other people successful in my neighborhood, I said, I want to be that. I, I want to earn that much, etc. So when does it become non-productive? Is there a point of no re return, in, in other words? Well, what we've done is to look at uh, the scale of income inequalities, the gap between rich and poor in uh, most of the rich developed countries. And we see that uh, the bigger the gaps, uh, the bigger the income gaps, the more of a whole range of health and social problems. And take the United States as an example, a country which among the developed world has about the biggest income differences. 
uh, you find that uh, they have the highest homicide rates, the highest obesity rates, uh, the biggest prison populations, uh, amongst the lowest uh, levels of life expectancy in the rich developed countries. Uh, so they run into a whole host of problems uh, that are very damaging and wasteful of talent. Uh, you see also their social mobility is low, um, drug abuse is high, all sorts of things like that go wrong. I want to ask you, um, you know, I've, I've watched some of your film and, and, and um, been very interested in what you're doing. Is, is it true that poor people live less? They have much shorter life expectancy. Within most of our develop, rich developed societies, there are uh, gaps in life expectancy between rich and poor areas, often within the same city, of anything from five to 15 years. Uh, that's average life expectancy in different neighborhoods within, uh, as I say, often within the, in the same city. Um, and if you look more widely across uh, uh, whole countries, you find even bigger gaps. Uh, and generally, it looks as if the bigger the scale of income differences in society, the bigger those uh, health inequalities. Do you think that there's a solution uh, that is viable, something that you can pitch to a government or pitch to um, you know, CEOs of companies, etc.? Is there a solution to this that is practical? And I'm talking about the mortality rates uh, and, and uh, access to health care, etc. I don't think that uh, it's sensible to try and deal with these problems without uh, tackling the underlying cause of inequality. And you'd have to be dealing with uh, violence, with uh, kids' maths and literacy scores, with social mobility, um, with homicide rates, with life expectancy, all as if they were totally different problems. But they are all rooted in the scale of inequality in society. So it's, it's silly not to tackle that root problem. The, the U.S. already devotes the lion's share of its, uh, of its budget to social programs. You have Medicare, you have Medicaid, you have Social Security, Income Security. It's, it's, uh, it goes on and on. It's, it's in the trillions. Um, so that's already the main balance sheet expense for, for, um, for America. On one hand, the U.S. is the most unequal of all developed uh, countries, but it also pays its dependents the most. Is, is this a dead end? What's now working with America? doesn't pay its dependents most. Uh, the welfare programs in the US are less redistributive than in most of the other countries. Almost everywhere, uh, tax and benefits, social security benefits, reduce the differences in market incomes, but they do that less in the United States than other countries. And indeed, some people have argued that why there is so little support for more progressive taxation and better welfare spending uh, and so much antagonism to the role of government in the US is because people get so little from government. Um, in, in the Scandinavian countries, the more equal countries, uh, the tax and benefits are much higher uh, and society has many fewer of all those problems. But it's not only the, the social costs that I've mentioned, I and mean, if you look at, um, I and mean, people often imagine that inequality is a spur to initiative and creativity. Uh, but if you look at patents per head of population, you find that uh, the more equal societies have much higher um, levels of patents per head of population. So societies not only waste their talent with lower social mobility, and kids getting uh, lower maths and literacy scores in these international uh, tests, um, but they, they also uh, lose out in these other ways. And it, it's, it's just, it's an astonishing waste of talent and the belief that it, it uh, is a boost to creativity is just wrong. Richard. Um, the old idea that, um, uh, 
inequality was good for economic growth uh, research from the International Monetary Fund, OECD, and the World Bank have all shown now that that's, uh, that's mistaken. I want to go back uh, just one bit with what you're saying about uh, the United States. So in 2019, 1.1 trillion has been devoted to Medicare and Medicaid, 1 trillion to Social Security, and um, you know, uh, income, uh, income security, which is all sorts of ways to, to pay out um, a lot of the dependents, is 300 billion. So what do you mean when, uh, when you say that they're not as, how is the United States running uh, more than a trillion dollars deficits a year, um, being a very large yes. collector of, of taxes, and then um, the Scandinavian countries uh, are doing more, just so people can understand what you're, what you're meaning. Uh, the U.S. spends more on medical care, much more on medical care than any other developed country per head of population, and ends up with worse health than any other. I've recently had uh, a surgery for uh, colon cancer. It was entirely free. The most expensive thing we had to pay was my wife coming in to visit me, paying parking charges. Um, the whole thing diagnosed effectively um, by my uh, family practitioner um, and hospital appointments booked and so on, all the blood tests, the screening and so on, uh, and then the surgery. Uh, and it was caught before it, was, before it spread at all, so I haven't even had to have chemo chemotherapy. That's great news. We have a health service that functions like that. Most of the developed countries have but you go on spending these huge sums uh, so ineffectively. First of all, that's great news um, to hear about the, um, uh, to hear about your surgery and, and the success. And uh, <laughs> I didn't know about it. Um, and secondly, I, so what you're saying is they're not spending less, they're spending ineffectively. That's, and that's interesting to, to note. Um, is there a connection, Richard, between, levels of philanthropy and social help and community work and the levels of trust in institutions and governments and inequality. Is there any sort of connection between how much will a society help each other, uh, do community work, the, uh, there will be philanthropy, and how much trust people have in the government um, and, and inequality? Is there a co correlation yes. between these subjects? Uh, it, it's quite closely related, actually. Um, we showed in our um, a book we produced um, some years ago called the, a book called The Spirit Level um, that uh, more unequal countries, uh, people trust each other less, they trust government less, uh, community life atrophies, it weakens with bigger income differences. Um, the data is very clear on that uh, from a number of different countries. Uh, the American General Social Survey has questions on trust that show this same pattern. You can look at it internationally, you can compare the different uh, states as the United States, and the picture is very similar, similar. More inequality, weaker community life, less trust. But with that goes higher rates of uh, violence in terms of uh, rising homicides. Um, and uh, you can even see, actually, that uh, expenditure on uh, safeguarding ourselves, if you like, uh, papers, research papers published in the peer-reviewed journals that show that more unequal countries uh, spend more on what they call guard labor, uh, security staff, prison officers, police. Um, these are the people we use to protect ourselves from each other. Uh, uh, and as inequality increases, um, we feel we need more of that. And if you go to the really unequal countries, countries like um, Brazil, um, uh, well, more perhaps uh, Mexico and uh, South Africa, which have even bigger income gaps than the United States, you find there that people um, are barricading their houses. 
um, big fences all around them, bars on the windows and doors, razor wire around the top of the fences. Uh, their inequalities have got to a point where people are actually frightened of each other. Um, and you see in the more equal countries uh, that there's a good deal of uh, neighborliness, um, reciprocity, uh, strong community life, people aware of the public good. It's a disastrous effect that you see with great inequality. Finally, you should mention uh, Brazil and Mexico, both countries I've been to and, and I've seen the presence of, uh, you know, of policemen just on street corners. It almost felt like it was a, a military um, and just, you know, in touristic areas just to keep the peace and make sure that the tourists are, are treated um, in the right way. I, w I want to ask you, you know, I know you, you're quoted as saying if Americans want to live the American dream that sh they should go to Denmark. Um, well, that was my wife's joke, actually. I borrowed it. <laughs> well, that's what I do with my best jokes as well. Um, I, I want to I ask you, what is the advantage, the advantage then of being born in the United States and not to money? Being born in the United States, but having to, to make it on your own? Well, you're more likely to make it on your own in, in more equal countries. I mentioned earlier that social mobility is unusually low in the United States. Um, and indeed, if you want to live the American dream, you should move to one of the more equal countries like, um, um, like Denmark, for instance. Uh, these things have been looked at by seeing how important father's income in is in determining son's income when the sons are uh, uh, grown up and earning. Sure. And in more unequal countries, father's income is very important. Basically, rich fathers have rich sons and poor fathers have poor sons. But in more equal countries, father's income doesn't make so much difference. Yeah, uh, Ray Dalio, uh, a super successful hedge fund manager, just released uh, one of his studies uh, going on for years that he says mobility in the United States has about a 14% chance of, of uh, uh, success. In other words, only one out of seven will ever um, will go from poverty to the one quarter um, that's, that's above it. And, and that's yeah. very disturbing. Um, and in Britain, as income differences have widened, we've seen social mobility slow. Sure. Um, you know, uh, is there any nugget or advice uh, uh, to someone, uh, aside from, from what we just talked, about how to tweak one's habits or do something that, that you feel will help listeners in terms of uh, understanding the world around them and, and understanding what's, um, you know, what they should do uh, depending on their situation, their circumstances, etc. Or the way that the world is, is, is headed uh, towards so people can prepare for the future. Well, I think that to deal with our uh, growing environmental problems, uh, part of the solution to that is greater equality. Um, I think that uh, the stronger community life makes it easier to deal with. But also, you see, what inequality does, it, it makes status and class more important. And with it, the idea that people are very different uh, worth, if you like. And that means it undermines our own sense of self-worth. Uh, we get more worried about how people judge us, um, which, which leads to, uh, in some people, to low self-esteem, um, uh, depression, and uh, you start to find social contact uh, um, very stressful. In others, it leads to narcissism. Uh, you try and sort of boost yourself in other people's eyes, but part of that is consumerism. The way we try and boost ourselves in other people's eyes is by having clothes with the right labels and a flashy car and so on. And you can actually see if you live in more unequal places, people spend more on these status goods they're more likely to spend money on a flashy car. And it's a, a powerful driver of consumerism, which of course is one of the big enemies of moving towards some kind of environmental sustainability. Uh, but the other thing I suppose is that all the research on happiness and well-being and health shows that uh, really important is the quality of our social relationships. 
uh, how many friends we have, whether we're involved in community life. That's what life is really about once we've got adequate um, material goods and so on. But unfortunately, uh, inequality turns our idea of what life is about. And it it makes it seem to us as if life is all about trying to get rich. And what we should be doing is getting enough and then finding the things that we enjoy and uh, like doing and uh, enjoying each other's company. That's so true. And I'm, I'm glad you said that. Uh, it's always been my, my absolute belief and conviction that you have to balance these things out. And there's literally, um, you know, one of the first books I've ever read <clears throat> in it, um, it talked, uh, somebody was um, in, in the age of Rockefeller and he said, this guy has everything he can ever want and he works rain or shine from, from you know, the early morning till the, the end of the night to have just another pair of pants or another pair of, uh, of ties. It's, it's unbelievable. Why would someone with all the material riches not pursue any, any other hobby or, or uh, any other uh, pursuit? Um, Richard, what's the best way to find your literature, your books, um, everything that, that you're all about? Well, uh, two books, I think, that uh, are useful. One is called The Spirit Level. Uh, called The Spirit Level because in, in England, what you call a spirit level is what you call an, a, a builder's level or a bubble level or something. Um, uh, more recently, though, we've written a second book uh, called The Inner Level, um, which uh, deals with the psychological effects of inequality, how it undermines those feelings of self-worth and leads to higher levels of anxiety and depression that are dogging our societies at the moment. Richard, thank you very much. What is there a website people can go to or, or is this all on Amazon? Well, we, um, you can get those books on, on Amazon. Um, the Inner Level is published by penguin in the usa and uh, the um, uh, spirit level was published by bloomsbury in the usa so they're both easily available uh, but we've also set up a, a, a registered charity in britain called uh, the equality trust and if you google the equality trust uh, you will find um, things to and it's set up to make the effects of inequality better known um, so to do that sort of educational and campaigning work uh, so look there too Richard Wilkinson thank you very much every make sure you watch the TEDx talk. just google TEDx and Richard Wilkinson for his 2011 talk about income inequality it's, it's amazing we talk about income inequality today wealth inequality today in 2019 but uh, this guy has been since 1973 talking about uh, income inequality and wealth inequality. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and we're off the air. Okay, thanks, All sir. Right. Thank a, thanks a lot. I hope that was okay. Yeah, definitely. Very interesting and uh, um, insightful, and we'll have it on uh, YouTube in a few days. It might even get more, more views than TEDx. Okay, good. I <laughs> think that's got uh, over 3 million now. On well, then, then no. <laughs> in that case. All right. Uh, but thank it's doing it. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. The U.S. is a very dysfunctional country in terms of its ability to allow opportunity to people with ambition but are in the bottom of the wealth pool. Financial literacy is critical to advancing as well as getting your mind in the vicinity of inspiring people. Wealth Research Group will continue to publish innovative interviews. As we enter this presidential year, enter a decade that is sure to challenge the U.S. empire and might be the last one where the dollar remains a reserve currency. Stay tuned for all of it.